You're listening to the 49 Carats Podcast, a 49ers goldmine production with Stephanie Sanchez. What's going on, everyone? Mm-hmm. Welcome to another edition of the 49 Carats Podcast. I'm your host, Steph, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome today's very special guest, the one, the only, <laughs> Stefania Bell. Stefania, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. This is a Steph and Steph podcast. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Name twins, almost, almost, pretty close. If you guys are not familiar with Stefania, you either don't like fantasy football or you live under a rock. She is ESPN's injury analyst, most often appearing on the Fantasy Focus podcast, which I listen to religiously, by the way. Um, and she is right. also a physical therapist, a certified strength and conditioning specialist. I would trust her with my medical records. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, that's wise, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what we'll be talking about today. As we know, there's a lot of injuries in 49ers land, as always seems to be the case, but in particular, two that we're really curious about, right? Brock Purdy and Trey Lance. And Stefania, when I first reached out to you, it was in the middle of the season. The 49ers back then, it felt like they were dealing with a number of injuries. So I thought it'd be perfect to have you on. Then time went on, and then there was another injury, and then Mm -hmm. another, and then the injury of the offseason, Brock Purdy's UCL injury. And there was just so much anticipation for that surgery because it felt like a lot of what the 49ers were going to do in the offseason kind of hinged on how that would go. Will it be a repair? Will it be a reconstruction? We even heard about a hybrid possibility Mm -hmm. surgery, right? And then the surgery was pushed back at, at least like another week because it was experiencing the swelling. And I, I have questions about the swelling because I saw some people speculate or just say that it's possible that meant that the elbow was maybe starting to heal on its own. Is that something that can really start to happen? Uh, so there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack in that one sentence, but uh, it's a few things. Um, the elbow will naturally start to heal on its own. I mean, anytime you have an injury, soft tissue injury, the body goes into a state of trying to repair itself. So that's going to happen. It's going to lay down scar tissue. It's going to try and do things to help the healing. I think um, we should back up a little bit because it will help explain it. But when you have uh, these UCL injuries, you know, the go-to besides the clinical exam where they're looking at the, the athlete is the MRI. And, and uh, in some cases, people will use dynamic ultrasound to, as, to augment it, but kind of the hallmark imaging is the MRI. Problem is, that's not perfect. You know, uh, you can see um, increased signal when you have inflammation. You can see where there's a defect in the tissue, but it doesn't really tell the whole picture. And part of what goes into the decision of whether you need to reconstruct uh, uh, UCL or whether you can repair it now that the repair has become more common is uh, what the tissue quality is. So you hear about this in pitchers all the time. And, and the reason that uh, reconstructions are necessary in pitchers the bulk of the time is because it's a degenerative tear, you know, tissues breaking down. In that case, um, you know, when those guys fail, usually the tissue quality is not great. Um, the, who knows what's happened over time? Maybe they've had minor tears and some attempt at, at mm-hmm. self repair has happened. There's some scar tissue built up, but they don't have great tissue. And so the chance of it healing itself is pretty slim. Um, and maybe you're just going to accumulate some more scar, but nothing's going to happen. The other situation where you can, where repair is a potential outcome is when you have uh, good quality tissue. So uh, the athlete has, uh, just like what happened with Brock, you have an acute trauma, right? So the ligament itself is pretty healthy, but it gets torqued and uh, the ligament tears, uh, but the actual quality of the ligament tissue itself is pretty good. And so you want to preserve that native ligament. That's always better than something Mm -hmm. That you have to steal from another part of the body and the the body will start to repair that ligament back down the problem is you have to balance what you want with the repair with too much scar 
And if a player is stiff and painful and sore, you really want to try and get that range of motion because you don't want them to be stuck with limited motion, especially if you're a thrower. So yes, it was already beginning some natural healing process. Um, that doesn't get in the way of the surgery. But when you have too much inflammation and limited range of motion, you go in and operate right away and the body's going to react by putting down way more scar and you don't want to gotcha. grow her. So the wise move was to back off and let that settle a bit and then go in. It's much cleaner surgery. Awesome. And, and it, you know, I think the fact that he had the best case scenario of the UCL repair indicated, and I, I know you mentioned this on Twitter as well, that, you know, the the state of, of that uh, ligament was in, in pretty good standing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Aside from the fact that it uh, the the fact that it was torn, but aside from that, it was it was pretty. Yeah. but that's but that's the thing. It can tear, can rupture because you have a violent traumatic injury to it. And also, when you you know just knowing that there was that much inflammation, I think reflects the violence of the injury. You know, it tells you that there was significant trauma because the inflammation stuck around for a while. Uh, but uh, you know, if the if the ligament, you have to it, people think of it like it like it's a like it's a band and you just tack it down, but there's layers to it. And if that's disintegrating or falling apart or very, you know, threaded, that's not a good quality tissue. But if you have that ligament looks really healthy and sturdy, then laying it down for repair is uh, much easier. And then they use the internal brace. So that actually augments it. Yeah. Okay. And, and so as we know, the, the UCL uh, repair surgery, originally reported by both John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan to be a six month timeline. Then I, I did see Eric Branch of the SF Chronicle. He put out an article and he said that a source, and I don't know if this is like a 49er source or a source close to Brock Purdy or maybe even the surgeon, a source declined to provide a rough full recovery timeline. And I don't, I don't know how, how to feel about that. <laughs> it, it makes me a little nervous. Uh, <laughs> is there any, reason that they would want to avoid putting a you know timetable on the recovery yeah i actually think it's smart because it takes pressure off the player and and we, we have to remember is that everybody heals at their own rate that's just the way it is and it was so often we put timetables like oh it's a this you know it's an acl that means it's a nine-month recovery and all you have to do is look at the spectrum of guys coming off acl injury um, and often that's because we don't know the details about what was involved. Was it an isolated ACL? Was it a ACL MCL? Was it, was there meniscus cartilage? All those things that they don't get shared with us necessarily, but they can certainly impact what happens during surgery and what happens in the recovery process. So uh, when you put, when you stick that out there as this is the recovery timetable, all of a sudden we're all looking at it. I say the collective we is like a fan base and saying, well, I can put this on my calendar because that means if it's six months, he'll be doing this and then he'll be ready for this and then this will happen. And the fact is not only do we not know just in terms of how an individual responds to surgery, but there's all these little peaks and valleys that can happen along the way. You know, There can be a little speed bump in a rehab process that's not a big deal to the overall outcome, but maybe at one point in time, uh, let's say, you know, an athlete coming off a of UCL repair gets sore when they're throwing. And so you want to scale it back and you dial back the rehab. And then if, if everybody's focused on the timeline, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, there's a problem and this, we're not going to hit this marker. And it's really important that the guidelines and the markers that are there for the athlete are based on what the progression is, the healing progression for one, like just the recovery from the procedure and then the functional progression in terms of getting back to what you need to do to return to play. And so I think um, I actually appreciate when organizations don't put a firm timeline on it or, you know, pe people around the player, whoever it is that's, that's stating this. Now, the 49ers did put out a statement and said kind of this, there's this typical, you know, return to throw around three months and return to play around six. And I'm fine with that because everybody's keeping it generic and understanding that what actually happens with this particular individual is based on his recovery. And remember, I, I get 
really ticked off about this every time the season rolls around for all these guys coming back from injury because everybody's focused on week one and it it trickles down to the player and then they're feeling like I got to get back week one or somehow I failed in my recovery. Brock Purdy is really young and he has this huge career in front of him. Why? Let's just say that it took him an extra month to, you know, come back and and he wasn't going to be ready to start the season. If that's what it needed for his career to in the longevity of his career and just in terms of, you know, how he performs when he does get back, all of that, then that's what you want. Uh, and, and that's what the people looking out for him should want. Yeah, I, I do feel a little guilty now because me, along with all the other 49er fans, were like, okay, six months, that puts him at like, you know, first half of September and he might be able to play in week one. You know, we've, we've, we're all going through that we're process. We're still going to do that. And that, it's okay because, look, the organization has to do it to a degree as well, right? Yeah. They're looking at the timeline and saying, okay, um, I mean, there's a reason that Sam Darnold is now a 49er. You know, and I, I think it's like I, I think I tweeted this at the time. It's like puts a veteran in the locker room because, number one, I mean, Brock Purdy's not throwing early when you have OTAs and, and even who knows where he is when you get into training camp. But it also it provides bridge insurance for them mm-hmm. no matter what. And so I think uh, th- those are the smart moves. And then you just see what happens with the player. But the organization has to think in some to some degree about timelines i just think that um we'd be smart to keep them loose more as a guideline as opposed to a hard and fast rule right that totally makes sense i'll start to do that or at least i'll try (laughs) um because yeah i mean we're we're all looking at you know maybe week one maybe week two and at this point, it, it, like, is it just too optimistic or is it just unfair to to put those like unfair? Yeah, I would say unfair. And, and because we don't know how it's going to go. And again, you know, the, the even in rehab programs, you look at sort of what, what's the big goal is uh, return to play and return yeah. to play um, is not return to performance. So the real goal is return to performance is returning to play at your pre injury level. That's always the ultimate goal. So return to play doesn't necessarily mean that, but as you know, when you're quarterback, you really don't get a long window of return to play and return to performance. So you want to be coming back when you're actually at that point where you can be at or near your pre injury performance level. And sometimes that part takes a little longer because it's not just getting through the injury. It's getting confident mentally and the recovery from that, et cetera, et cetera. So the job in rehab, and this, this is what we do, is you break it down into the smaller goals, right? So you, you ha- kind of have your eye on the prize of, yes, ultimately, that's what you want to get to. But right now, we got to get the range of motion you know, totally resolved and the swelling to go down post-surgery. Okay. And then the next thing we do is this. And, that, and so you set these smaller goals. And that also allows the athlete to be successful, right? Okay. I did this. I did this. I did this and keeps them positive going forward on the outside. We don't get all the reports on all of that. So you get very anxious, like, well, how's he doing? What, what, what's going on? Is he going to be ready? Because that's all, you know, is, is he going to be ready? I would say that um, we just can't make that. We just can't make that prediction right now. Yeah. And I I think it's important that you make that distinction that, you know, him being fully clear doesn't necessarily mean he's out and ready to play, you know, once that happens. Right. I I think that definitely makes sense because I think for a lot of us, like that's kind of been the assumption. Right. And so I think it's important to kind of have that at the back of our minds and the, you know, adding Sam Darnold to the mix when you already have Trey Lance, the 49ers, I feel like they could slow play it with Brock Purdy. They, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily need to rush him back. So good, good to know on that. Well, you know, this surgery is still very much uncharted waters for football players. We talked about the fact that, you know, pitchers have this very often, and it seems like they're able to um, go back to the regular selves. But Purdy and Nick Mullins, they're the only two that have had this surgery. Ironically, both as members of the 49ers, Stefania, I know it's a very small sample size, but do we know yet it, how the surgery might impact football players differently than baseball players? What well, we can go by what the demands of the job are, right? They don't have to grip something uh, with their hand, which makes a difference because 
um, the stress at the medial elbow, the inside of the elbow where the injury is, is different when you are holding something and gripping and squeezing here. That's your flexor tendons. Remember in baseball pitchers, you often hear about these flexor tendon injuries that go along with ulnar collateral ligament injuries, especially as they break down over time. Uh, you're not holding the ball like this with this massive yeah. grip. The grip is different. That actually is less stress on the inside of the elbow, the way you have to grip the ball, the way you throw the ball, you're not do it's not a complete wind up over the top and coming down. It's the direction of the throw easier on the elbow. And you're not doing hundreds of pitches over and over repetitively at max velocity, getting in and out of these extreme positions, going through this accelerated range, your total range of motion, your arc of throwing is different with football, all of those things work in your favor if you're a quarterback. So, you know, that is that's part of the reason that as a quarterback, you can probably get back a little bit more quickly than a pitcher would off of this. And we've already seen that pitchers are coming back. That's that's where the six month time frame comes from. Um, but they're still often getting comfortable with their throws. The thing is, in addition to being it's not just throwing uh, for the demands of a quarterback, it's throwing all different uh you know, directions, all different ways of parts of the field. You have yeah. to be able to throw short intermediate as well as deep. You have to be able to throw cross body, you know, so those are all the things that you have to integrate into the end portion of your rehab and your throwing. And then it's total volume. You know, can you do enough that you can throw what you need to over four quarters of a game? Um, so the, the volume for them is, is relative to what they did previously. The volume for a baseball pitcher relative to what they did previously, but the demands in baseball are just generally harder on the elbow because anatomically they're harder on the elbow to begin with. That's why they have so many problems. That makes a lot of sense. And some of those things I had never thought of before, like there's just the fact that there'd be more stress on the elbow for a baseball player, less for an NFL quarterback. But the one thing I'm worried about is the the nature of the sport. Clearly, football is is a lot more physical than baseball. Quarterback way more prone to get hit than than say a pitcher. Um, so, given that, is there any heightened risk of you know re-injury or re-aggravation for a quarterback compared to a pitcher? Well, you'd certainly rather that he didn't take that exact same mechanism of hit again. And what's interesting is we've seen a lot more upper extremity injuries to quarterbacks because of contact. If you think about what happened to Drew Brees and his uh, thumb, you know, there's a, a UCL in the thumb as well. So when we talk about ulnar collateral ligament, there's one in the elbow, there's one in the thumb. Drew Brees had the thumb uh, ulnar collateral ligament injury that had to be repaired. We saw Russell Wilson have a hand injury from a contact hit. This is happening more and more to quarterbacks. And then Nick and Brock essentially had the same mechanism of injury where they were up in that position pre-throw and then they got their arm forced back in the exact direction that it takes to injure the UCL. And that is part of, will be part of Brock's recovery is knowing, you know, are you going to be comfortable standing in knowing that there's somebody coming at you? Uh, and what are you going to do to try and avoid that kind of thing? Now, he didn't even see it coming. So it just right. it blindsided him. Uh, and there's really there's no way to know. I mean, the, 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 you hope that the, rep the repair is going to be solid and there's going to be some scar built in. Uh, the internal brace is um, it's, it's basically a synthetic uh, fiber tape that is put in um, kind of straddles superimposed over the ligament to help. Uh, create like a check rein and it really helps while the ligament is scarring down so that you can start to do activity without uh, fear of disruption of the repair. Um, but it's also, it's also there as a reinforcement um, for that ligament. So no guarantees though, right? At some point, especially with football players being the size and the speed that they are, if you subject the elbow to the exact same stress, potentially you could re-injure it. We've seen uh, baseball pitchers have second Tommy John surgeries as a result. Usually that's breakdown. Again, it's not contact. Um, so we just don't really know in football because like you said, there hasn't, there hasn't been that much, you know, yeah. to, to study it. And, and I think even looking at the different roles of Nick Mullins, who is a, is a backup quarterback now with the Vikings and, you know, Brock Purdy, who may at some point start, right. 
Nick Mullins maybe hasn't had the opportunity to to take hits, you know, post surgery mm -hmm. because uh, for the, the exposure part, is like, less. The exposure yeah, exactly. is so, less. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, what I, I'm going to be like very tense if I if I watch a rock party in a game. <laughs> I'm at, I mean, that's a, but that really is you bringing up a really important part of the recovery, right? Because like we're all talking about, like we'll be nervous when at, for all these guys, no matter what they're coming back from. If it again, I use ACL because we think of that as such a big deal and it's relatively mm -hmm. common. Every time they get back. That is a big part of the recovery is they have to get used to, um, you know, people coming at them. They have to get used to taking contact and it does help them when they start to take it. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm OK. Like they bounce back up or, you know, the first time he takes a big hit on that arm with even it just doesn't have to be the same mechanism, but something or he lands on it awkwardly and people fall on top of him. Those things happening will help him get over any kind of lingering concern about what, you know, could this happen again? But that's just a, a very real part of the recovery that often gets overlooked. Yeah, I, absolutely. I was going to say the same thing, those mental hurdles, and it really does make a difference, especially in, uh, you know, how the player responds and how they typically would maybe play could change that. I know that a lot of pitchers, who have gotten Tommy John, they end up saying that their arm feels stronger than before. But as we know, um, you know, Brock Purdy didn't have Tommy John. He had the repair. So is there any risk that Brock Purdy's arm could lose power because he had the repair and not the Tommy John or his mechanics oh, no. could be impacted? No, I think. And, you know, so there's a couple things uh, uh, there. Again, um, baseball players, we used to – it's actually, I was going to say we used to laugh, but there's part of it that's not funny because all these young kids who ended up with uh, ulnar collateral ligament injuries who are baseball players, they, they would be rushing to Tommy John surgery because they would, I mean, we've really had an epidemic of it in baseball and I don't want to digress too much, but I do feel strongly about it um, because there was a perception that you would be stronger and be able to throw mm -hmm. harder after you had that surgery to the point where some parents were proactively trying to seek out Tommy John surgery for their kids, which I just can't even like, I just can't speak about that, but it did. It's like people were seeing that who did the surgery in the clinic um, because of that perception that you would throw harder. And really um, there's been studies. We, we, we've, there's been plenty that's in the sports medicine literature comparing pre and post Tommy John performance metrics. And often what you do see is an elevation in terms of velocity of pitch delivery um, and, and maybe endurance of throwing, et cetera, and certainly command and location once they get back. But you have to remember that most of these injuries were degenerative. So guys were struggling with things beforehand. So they're often you see a dip in performance before they would actually have pain associated with it. So relative to where they were right when they got hurt, yes, their performance had improved. But if you look at like peak performance versus post-op, that rarely is a thing. Now we've seen some pitchers come back and be amazing or at least rise to the same level. Um, but it also speaks to the fact that when you have a full Tommy John, you're off for 12 or 16 months from baseball. And for most guys, they've never had that amount of time off, not since they were children because they're pitching year round. And so when you have all that rehab time and there's not a ton you're actually doing for your elbow early on, they are working their core. They're getting leg strength. They're doing all this intensive training and rehab that they haven't done because they've never had that much downtime. So if all those things are getting better, it's probably helping your pitching performance too. So I, there's a lot in that perception of yeah. being stronger or being able to throw the ball harder or better. I, I, again, in football, we've got like a sample size of two or we will, you know, at this point with a repair. And as far as reconstruction, there was really only Jake Delhomme who was a, a an NFL quarterback who came back and played as an NFL quarterback following a full Tommy John. So we, we don't know, but I, I would suggest that, um, you know, the, these were acute injuries. So it wasn't like they were breaking down before they had this procedure and they're probably just going to feel like they get back. Their goal is going to be to get back to what they were before the injury. 
Right. Okay. That makes sense. And it, it did make me feel better that you said no so quickly. So <laughs> um, we shouldn't be worried about, uh, you know, Brock Purdy's strength not being the same pre-surgery. Yeah. Awesome. Now, there's another 49ers quarterback who, you know, we're pa- also patiently waiting to, to see fully cleared, and that is Trey Lance. And he's back throwing again, and that's a great sign after he had that second surgery. Um, and we were just talking about Purdy's arm strength you know, Trey Lance suffered a broken ankle. So along those same lines, would there be any concern that, you know, Trey Lance maybe loses any speed coming off this injury? Well, this is a little, this is a little different in my estimation, because again, it, it goes to the style of player that he is mm-hmm. and all we, and, you know, again, with him, we have a small sample size of his performance. So we yeah. don't really know we, we are trying to compare what he'll be post injury to what we expected he could be. We haven't really had a chance to see that. So it's going to be hard for us to fully gauge. I mean, I think only Trey Lance will really know um, unless there's something obvious that's glaring. That's a deficit, which I, I don't anticipate, but I will say coming off that type of injury, fractured fibula, you know, ankle injury uh, for somebody who is mobile, and depends on speed and agility and mobility. I mean, he is a very graceful runner. I mean, he, and he is nimble and he can move so quickly and his footwork is so good in terms of being able to move himself uh, in and out of position. That is harder to get back after that kind of injury, you know, that you run the risk of, you know, your ankle gets stiff. You don't have the same kind of mobility. You lose some of the proprioception, which is kind of knowing where that joint is in space. You have to really retrain that. You have to get all the balance and coordination back. That's harder to do. Not impossible. Not impossible. Mm -hmm. If he was a stand in the pocket guy, I wouldn't think twice about it. He's not. So this is going to be interesting to me to see, how does he get back? And, you know, there's no reason to think that he can't. I, cer- I certainly don't want to imply anything negative. There's no reason to think that he can't. It's just that's some extra work. And it's definitely a consideration. It's something to be on the lookout for. So, I mean, do you think that maybe we see Trey Lands be more contained, or contain himself in the pocket a little bit more than maybe he would have or I guess in the small sample size that we've seen, um, you know, coming back from this? I mean, I don't, I don't know whether he will do that. I would say that that, you know, unless it's uh, by design that they're wanting him to do that, which I don't think is the case because it's not why you brought him here in the first place. Uh, I think you really want to encourage him to be who he was as a quarterback, right? right? You want, you want to restore him to him. And uh, you certainly don't want to be in a position of, of playing with apprehension. There yes. will be some of that to get over, uh, just as we talked about um, in Brock's case. In, in Trey's case, it'll be you have to get over the fear of being hit on that ankle. You have to get over the fear of going down on that ankle. You have, you have to be smart. There's a way to say, okay, let's be smart. Let's not take unnecessary contact. We know that, you know, they really tried. That was a point of emphasis with Jimmy um, before is to try and not be in some of those situations. And we've seen other quarterbacks um, come back in the league and do things. Think about Jalen Hurts when he was playing earlier this year after he had that chest injury. And the big issue, the big concern with the kind of injury that he had was don't fall directly on that or land on that Mm -hmm. left side where you can make that he had an SC joint injury. So right at the center of his chest, that can be more vulnerable. And literally they they were working with him on trying to fall on the back of his shoulder. So if he went down, go down that way, or just get out more quickly, sometimes as a bridge, that'll be the guidance is, you know, let's try and not take as much contact, you know, get out. Don't, don't get that extra yard. Let's just make sure we're, we're, we're keeping you upright. Um, But doing that, and not coaching fear into it, which is tricky. Yeah. I mean, I I know they were already trying to get him to, you know, slide more and he was kind of working through that. So maybe we see a little more of that, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, this season, as far as that second surgery though, that he had Lance himself talked about, you know, getting depressed when he heard about needing that second surgery. So like how much of a setback was that really for him? If at all? 
You know, I, I don't think like it's not uncommon. Let's put it this way. It's not uncommon to have hardware removal because uh, the fibula is so it's very superficial. I mean, if you find it on your your lower leg, it's the skinny bone on the outside of your leg and the, the distal part of it, the part down down low is what makes your ankle bones and you can feel it. Like you can feel it right there. So it's right near the skin. Not a lot of padding. You put hardware in over that. Sometimes the hardware becomes an irritant. Um, you know, you can either feel it there. Um, you get a little nerve. Sometimes you can irritate little superficial nerves with that. And it's giving you some tingly stuff. And so they will go in and take the hardware out um, because the hardware really is there as a bridge for the bone to heal as long as you have good union. And when you first take the hardware out, you know, you're, you're removing some, it's going to leave some holes. So the bone has to fill in where those holes are to make it, you know, strong. But uh, we see that all the time. And it's, in other words, it's not an uncommon thing for hardware removal, but you have to back off a little bit while you're recovering from that secondary procedure. So not a setback per se, like, oh, wow, things went south, but it will extend that whole rehab window, which goes back to what we were talking about before about timelines and how yeah. things can be so different with different people. And if he was having discomfort and not able to move the way that he wanted to, that, and you've been holding that up, you know, sometimes it does take a little bit longer to get the strength back, to get the mobility. So it just is extending the whole overall picture of the rehab window, in, in my opinion. Well, well, thank you also for making that distinction because an extended timeline doesn't necessarily mean a setback. It isn't necessarily like some bad thing. I mean, it sounds like this was something that needed to happen and was for the best for him, even if it did add some time to his, you know, timeline. Mm -hmm. So that, that is good to know. And Lance is fully expected to be cleared by OTAs. And, you know, he did begin throwing again in February, you know, John Lynch, he's repeatedly pointed out that, you know, Lance needs to stay healthy. He needs to stay healthy based on the injuries that he has had. And at this point, like he's had a few like the thumb, the, the ankle. Um, is it fair for there to be concerns over Trey Lance's durability? Like do do his injuries indicate that there is some type of pattern with him in his injuries? I just think we're, you know, again, it's the small sample size thing like we it feels like a lot early, but yeah. he could go on to have, you know, three seasons of full gameplay. Who, who is to know? Uh, I would I certainly wouldn't hold it against him or put any labels on him just yet. Um, I mean, if we did, we'd have to label the entire 49ers team, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they've had some, they've, they've been high up in the injury department. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't label him as I yet. I certainly, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't assign that to him. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fair. And, and you know, you're talking about the fact that the 49ers, they, they're no strangers to injuries. They have a long track record now of, you know, having a lot of injuries suffered. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo had a number of injuries in his oh, time yeah. in San Francisco. Lance, a small sample size. But even Purdy, it, like it, in his small bit of starting, you know, he had two injuries, oblique and, and now the UCL. Um, Kyle Shanahan has been questioned about his role in these injuries, which, you know, he've dismissed. Is it fair for people to place blame on Kyle or even the, the strength and conditioning staff when, you know, they see the team continue to deal with these injuries? Uh Boy, this is such a loaded question because we could spend like an entire hour on this. It is, um, is it fair to place blame? I would say as a, just unilaterally, no. Is it fair to ask questions about what could be different that, you know, might be impacting injuries? Totally fair. And the team has to do that as well. And I, I know that they are, it's not like, when everyone's asking Kyle Shanahan about injuries, it's not like this is a surprise to him. You know, I mean, I think like, like the 49ers have been very, they've been looking, they've tried to make some changes. They've made some changes internally. Um, the league has made change recommendations to practice windows. I mean, I think that's really interesting as well. Uh, they had a modified ramp up. They had a secondary ramp up this year. So, um, when the NFL, they, they put out their health and safety data, or at least they share some of it with us uh, as they come up with it. But 
basically this year, the big difference was they added a second ramp up during the preseason because, and they did this because uh, we see the preseason injury patterns are very, very, um, what's the word uh, predictable basically over the last decade or so that you would see people come into camp. And as we know, people come in in varying degrees of fitness and in shape and football ready or not. And uh, they would see the spike in injuries within the first two weeks, soft tissue injuries. So uh, the idea was, why don't we ramp up activity, get a few days of conditioning before you even get into football activity. So they've seen that the injury numbers at that point have dropped a little bit, but what they saw a few years, a couple years ago was that then when they went to pads, um, then all of a sudden the injuries went up again. So what they did this year was they added a secondary ramp up period when they got into pads and they saw that um, there was some improvement there. And so it's really about uh, there, it, injuries are multifactorial and that's uh, sometimes hard to remember when we want to place blame because you're frustrated, right? Nobody wants to see, I mean, from a business standpoint, it's terrible for the 49ers because if you look at like, you know, dollars in terms of replacement, like you can see all the injury money adding up on the sideline mm-hmm. side by people who are out of games or placed on IR. Um but it's also, you know, for the fans, you want to see the players that you want to see out there. You want to see your starters out there. And it's frustrating for the athletes as well. And it's frustrating for the league because they don't like it when the faces of the league are out. So it, it's certainly something that everyone takes seriously. I don't think anyone's dismissive of it. And it can seem like one team, there must be a problem when there's a trend. I would say normally I'm pretty um, much in defense of team. If you have an aberration a year or two, sometimes Mm. you just had really bad luck. Uh, But when you start having three, four years where you're leading the pack, there's probably something to it. Pinpointing what that is, or if it's several different things that then need to be modified, that's what's really tough. And I'm not privy to what their inner conversations are within the organization, but I do know that they have been looking at a a broad number of things. There's some things that they can't control. They can't control the playing surfaces when they go elsewhere. And that's certainly been a hot topic. And I think you're going to see some changes in the off season to a couple of the fields around the league. Um, but that's a factor too. And that, you know, 49ers lost two guys to ACL injuries when they played at the Meadowlands or a couple of years ago. So what, what are you going to do when, when that happens? You know, that's, that's not necessarily on you. So um, it is everything from footwear uh, to, uh, you know, like you mentioned, practice and fatigue, intensity of work, timing of that work, playing surfaces, travel, I mean, travel is one of the things people looked at teams that have to travel greater distance and might have sleep deficits. Does that play a factor? It's just so enormous that I think it's very tough um, for any team to get a handle on like, well, if we make this change over here, this is definitely going to improve this. You try um, and hopefully you have a strategy. You're not just throwing darts at things that never works. Um, But uh I don't know how to explain to anyone. I get as frustrated as any other fan when I see the 49ers struggling with the injury problem. Right. I believe it was a football outsiders. I think they, they put mm-hmm. out a list of like the, the most injuries in, in like the past 10 years, I believe. And the 49ers were like the third most right yep. in that span. And and I always think to myself, cause you know, th- this is a topic that comes up pretty often, almost every year. And People ask, like, what do you think is the issue with, uh, you know, the 49ers? I think if they knew, they would <laughs> they would fix it, right? So I don't think anyone knows, okay. even them. So yeah. uh, it's definitely tough. And and to your point, there's so many variables in it. So it, it is pretty tough. I get that. You know, um, t- talking about training camp and the wrap-up periods and all that, the 49ers – have had a lot of injuries around that time or before the season starts that, that I've noticed. And then it kind of, it's like some injuries that linger then in the season or like the first half of the season, um, former 49ers safety, Jaquaski Tart, when he went to the Eagles, um, and I think he, he just spent a training camp with them. He was pretty open about how hard the 49ers practice. And I don't think he realized until he was then with another team 
could the intensity of practices open players up to injury risks, like especially mm -hmm. after a down period, like we were talking about the offseason? Yes. And I think, you know, what you're seeing is so many um, teams are using wearables and things now to try and evaluate uh, workload. Um, you know, you've heard the term load management thrown around, um, which fair or unfair, but the idea of looking at workload totals, looking at fatigue and being able to monitor things in real time so that you can make adjustments because uh, what one set of players might be able to do and function fine might be overload for another set of players. And, and so uh, that's really on the uh you know, performance staff to be looking at those things and interpreting them and making some kind of uh, modification recommendations as they see fit. I do know that uh, the NFL is now requiring that all mandating that all wearable data from practices included is being shared league wide because they're going to look at that and try and, you know, help uh, spread best, best practices around. Um, so if they see that they, they did this when they were looking at um, teams that had higher injuries during the preseason. And I was talking about the acclimation period they did. They basically went and visited the teams that had the biggest problems and where they were like, so here's what we're seeing. And this is something you might want to take a look at. And it was interesting. Um, Dr. Alan Sills, who's the chief medical officer of the NFL, uh, was talking about this in a presentation that some of the team's perception was, if we're not going this hard or if we, you know, don't do X, Y, and Z number of practices, we're, at, we're hurting ourselves. We're hurting our competitive advantage. Um, we're going to be failing by the end of the year. And they went back and showed that the teams that were actually meeting the criteria, but, you know, doing better with managing all of that were the ones winning the Super Bowls at the mm -hmm. end. So, uh, it was like, oh, I mean, and I think it was a learning experience because I think, you know, you could get into whole the, you know, beliefs and like change it, you know, that you you have, you know, basically what, what do you call it? Um, confirmation bias when you're like, OK, well, we didn't win. Well, it's probably because we're not doing enough. Of the, if this is what you believe that you need to do, then you're going to find things that support that. And I think them educating um, being the league with some of this data and saying, mm -hmm. no, nope, the data shows differently. I think that's how you'll get some teams to change. I don't know where the 49ers fall in that because they did not share any team specifics. Okay. So I can't say like they were the outliers or, or I don't know. Um, but I do know that they are looking at how different teams are doing practices and some of the wearable data that's coming in is going to be looked at probably over the next couple of years so that they can then provide feedback to the teams. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it, the NFL, of course, is always, you know, at the forefront of like new technology and things like that. So um, it, it's nice that they're using that to, to kind of help teams in this regard. Um, like what what other performance technology or, or maybe techniques have you been seeing NFL teams adopting lately? I remember when the muscle gun was like a, a new thing before. Oh, the the, 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 the like yeah, massage the, thing yeah, that you see on the sidelines all the time now. Yeah. Yeah, that um, before it blew up as a consumer product, yeah. you know, I remember it blew up as a thing with NFL teams. So what's what's the new thing these days? You know, there's always toys. And I think that's that, you know, everybody's got something that you need to have in the training room. You must have it here that, you know, it, it, there's things all over the place. And we could spend hours going through what all these different devices are and, and uh, whether they really, you know, everybody's got data to show that their thing is the best thing, whether they actually really do anything or hold up to any scientific rigor is, a, is another question. Sometimes it doesn't matter because if it's something that's relatively benign and the players really like it. Um, you know, people who work in the training rooms will tell you sometimes that that actually is a benefit too. Um, but I think, you know, the biggest thing I would say in the last decade has been the, the introduction of the blood flow restriction training which now every NFL team is utilizing. Uh, it took a while for a couple of the last teams to jump on board, but um, everybody's using it now. And uh, I've certainly, I've done a feature on it. We've talked about it at length, um, but uh, basically using modification of blood flow to enhance some performance gains. And, and there are 
that has been studied uh, at the metabolic level. I mean, there are actually some very real physiologic benefits to doing that. And you can do blood flow restriction training when you have uh, limitations in weight bearing, for example. And so you can mm-hmm. basically, you're creating some of the physiologic benefits of exercise like you would get with load bearing resistive exercise when you still have to modify load bearing. Um, so that a huge, that's a huge uh, thing that's really, I think, people have found ways to integrate that into all forms of rehab. That's probably the biggest thing around the league. I think um, some of the things I'm seeing now with the neuromuscular training are really interesting to me. Um, And you've probably seen some of it on the internet with guys who are doing these balance and coordination and timing things where they're having to tap things or balancing on one, like while they're doing it or something, it's almost looks like a video game intervention along with, um, you know, some sort of dynamic stabilization training. And I think, you know, VR and AR now that these tools that people can use to do simulation things are going to be like the next wave, because not only can you train yourself to be a better performer by using some of those, so just augmenting performance, but on the rehab front, let's say we were talking about, you know, being fearful of contact or, um, I've had quarterbacks talk to me about that feeling of being swarmed when they're coming back from ACL and that what if you could simulate it without putting them in the real risk, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's where some of that, the VR technology comes in to play and they can actually be put in those stressful situations and have, and it helps them mentally get over it. And also physically they're working on what they need to physically do in that situation. So a lot of things in the area of recovery, I think recovery in terms of performance, that's going to be the next big thing. Next big frontier is not just performance, like when you're on the field, but how does what you do in the immediate aftermath, as far as recovery change, uh, what your performance is subsequent to that. So you're seeing more teams bring things, do things on the airplane, um, to make sure that recovery is optimized post game, you're seeing more athletes um, see it a lot in the NBA, actually, this is where they're just some of the most sophisticated going in after games and actually doing uh, blood flow restriction sessions or doing some kind of active recovery because of what it does for them in terms of how they feel the next day. I mean, we, we heard about Russell Wilson stretching on an airplane, right? I mean, <laughs> maybe he was on to something there. <laughs> um, well, look, as we know, it, all of this has been really uh, insightful, and, and I thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us. Um, but we know, I, I know that you're a 49ers fan yourself. Oh, uh, yes. And so I Please. definitely got to pick your shirt. brain about that. <laughs> yes, there we go. I got to pick your brain about that. First, like, how did you become a 49ers fan? Uh I don't know. I grew up in the Bay Area. You know, I grew up a 49ers fan. It's funny because we grew up, I we went to Raiders and Niners games when the Raiders were the Oakland before they were LA, before they were Oakland, now Las Vegas. Um, but uh, I think I, I got mad when they left. And I, I always had a little more leaning to the 49ers. So we kind of become a, we became a sweat household when I was a kid. My mom stayed a Raiders fan. My dad and I were true, true 49er fans. And my brother, he followed to the 49ers. So my mom's the only one on the dark side now. I, I still have a little bit of love for the Raiders, but uh, really Fort Niner fan through and through. And then um, it's funny when I was a kid and I was doing, you know, dance and I did baton twirling and we had, we would go out to the 49ers, like we were on the field. So I was there like from the time I was like, I, I think I was like eight years old when I did that, you know, for a couple of years and we'd be at the games. 49ers were so bad then that um, the, the stadium and it was candlestick and it was freezing, but the stadium was wide open. So you yeah. could, um, I remember my parents, they could just sit wherever. And if like we rotated to a different part of the stadium, you could just move around because there was like nobody there. Oh and it, it's so crazy to think back to those days and we, we longed for them to be good. And then, you know, finally they got there and, and kind of the, my, um, you know, the teams of the eighties, you know, the dynasty mm-hmm. Niners that really started, um, I think with Eddie Departolo was there and t- it, it, that was also an era when, you know, there was, it wasn't like this free agency stuff with players moving around. 
players stayed. You know, you got to know your players. They were there um, for their entire careers or the majority of their careers. And I think that also just built incredible loyalty um, to the teams. And you could go and root for the same guys. And I thought to me was just cemented everything because uh, not only were they winning uh, and doing a lot to win. And I mean, we had the great rivalries, like, you know, the Cowboys Niners rivalries that were back then. And I, it's so funny because now I have ended up working with so many of these guys and Darren, Woodson, awesome. Darren Woodson would get so mad at me. I just bring up the 49, you know, so mad because we were so good then when he played and they, we were always tough for them to beat. Um, but we had our years where we struggled to beat the Cowboys. So I, I think like just having, that dynasty at a really key point of my uh, youth, if you will, um, kind of cemented that bond with the 49ers. And it was so much fun to go to games and we didn't care if candlestick was freezing. And it was, it was funny because you'd get some of these days where it would be beautiful and sunny and warm. You'd be like, why can't it be like this all the time? You know? Right. Um, and then, uh, and, but uh it was, it was a great play. It was just a great football setting. And um, it really, that those were the days, you know, and I love, st look, I still love the 49ers. And look, they're having all kinds of success now, but that really cemented my love for the Niners then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, Wayne Breezy here says there was no salary cap back then. So that's <laughs> why you could just know. keep everyone. <laughs> you know, super team Eddie, great. Eddie we're, we're Bartolo used to send all the 49ers to Hawaii. Like they, they would have the pro bowl in Hawaii and then he would say, take the families. And then he would send other people. Like there was just, you could spend, you could spend, spend, spend. And they took good care of the team. And there was just so much love, the team and the ownership, the team and the fans. It was just, it felt like a family and uh, it was, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. So, I mean, you said you, you can kind of get to know the players a little bit more because they stay with the team longer. Who is your favorite 49er of all time? <laughs> so I, I knew you were going to ask this and I still was like, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. So I will tell you, I used to want to be Ronnie Lott. Like if I was like, when we played um, flag football in high school and stuff, I always wanted to be the safety. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Like everybody wants to be the quarterback. And I always, and here, look what I do for a living. And I wanted to be Ronnie Lott because nobody hit harder than him, which is so counter to, <laughs> you know, here I am like talking about concussions all the time, but I just love the way he played the game. Uh, I think that, you know, he, he to me was like the ultimate football player and I wanted to be number 42 and I wanted to be Ronnie Lott and that's the position I wanted to play because I always thought it would be more fun to be delivering the hit than to be on the receiving end of it. So, but I always loved, you know, Jerry Rice was just one of my favorite, fa because how could you not? Because he was such a game changer. He get, he, he could, um, the, the, any game there was nobody could completely cover him nobody could take away the threat of jerry rice but that whole era that we were just talking about all these people who who were who kind of ran through that time and it, one blended into the other but back when ronnie lott was playing and you had keena turner and you know roger craig you start and then the, all the montana mm -hmm. uh montana rice years and brent jones to me was like he was the first like we talk about these tight ends and Rob Gronkowski and all that, but Brent Jones was one of the first pass catching and also capable blocking tight ends that we really ever saw. And I don't think people remember that unless you were really paying attention to football back then. It's like, Oh, this, this novelty. I think he was one of the reasons 49ers could, could be so good. So, um, you know, Merton Hanks, I have a funny story about Merton Hanks when I first met him at a Super Bowl, and I, he came over. I, I, it's a funny story. Uh, well, it was funny to me, but it was Super Bowl Miami. I want to say it was like I had only been working at ESPN for maybe a couple of years at that point. And there was a party at the Clevelander. It was the I think it was the I think it was the EA Madden party. Anyway, a bunch of 49ers were there and um, there was all, you know, just everybody around athletes, all this. But I and I was with a friend and I was like, I think that's Merton Hanks. And uh, I'm not usually, you know, I'm not 
very easily like starstruck, but Mm -hmm. 49ers who I put on that pedestal from that era, I was. And so I was like, I think that's him. But, you know, it's so funny because, you 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 know, they're in street clothes and it's years later. And uh, I I decided that I I just kept looking at him because then I would see him talking to what looked like a group of other 49ers. And I thought I better stop um, staring or he's going to think, you know, I have a weird obsession. And then we decided, okay, we're going to leave because I didn't have the nerve to go over and say something. I don't want to bother him. And um, all of a sudden he comes up to me, like he saw me leaving and came over to me and I'm like, Oh my God, he's going to say something like, why do you keep staring at me? (laughs) He he goes, I know you probably don't know who I am, but I know who you are because I watch fantasy football every Sunday. And this, and I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) So he's like, I'm I'm like, I know who you are. I know who you are. And so then we get in this whole talk about the 49ers. It was great. And I remember I got in a cab and the first thing I did was call my dad. And I was like, you're not going to believe this story, but Merton Hanks knows who I am. (laughs) So, um, you know, those are like the moments that made my, they made my, you know, year here at ESPN. And, and like, look, since that time, Jerry Rice worked for us for a while. And I would be on set with Jerry Rice. I think this is so ridiculous. <laughs> like, you know, got to know him. And I used to see him in in Redwood City from time to time. We went to the same dry cleaners and stuff when I was living out there. But um, to, like, be working side by side with, with him. And I'm thinking of all the years that I was just, you know, looking at him, at, admiring his ability and now we'd be right. talking about something about football. So um, a lot of fun. Just uh, the, uh, Dwight Clark, may he rest in peace. I mean, there's so many 49ers that I absolutely loved and, and, and all the memory you can tell by my like babbling on about it. Bryant Young, you know, one of the best defensive players we ever saw, who to me was one of the best comeback player of the year stories. Um, I could go on. <laughs> you almost named the entire team there. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah. I think a lot of people were impressed by you saying uh, Ronnie Lott because, you know, mm-hmm. often that's not people's first answer. As great right. as he was, you usually get like the Jerry Rice, the Joe Montana's, you know, uh, I, I I appreciate that answer for sure. And uh, on, on the topic of like, you know, favorite players, one of mine is Joe Staley and, you know, Frank Gore. And I got oh, the yeah. chance. I mean, to- how could I not? I actually – you know, Frank Gore is like the next generation. Yeah, I mean, anyone yeah. who knows me, you know, it's funny story that when I came to ESPN, I was interviewing here. One of the things that came up was Frank Gore and we talked and I it was because they were talking to me about injuries and I went on this whole tirade about he is not injury prone and here's why. And I went through this whole and I just was adamant like he had uh, to me, he was at risk. He had some like we, we talk about people who like, once you tear your ACL, you're going to tear your other one. He had probably some loose, you know, he probably had like stretchy collagen. He had a shoulder, but once he got the shoulders and knees, I'm like, he's good. And we all know Frank Gore's durability record. So I yeah. stand by that. It is what it was talked about during my interview. I got hired. I'm still here. Frank Gore stayed in the league a really long time. So um, I love Frank Gore. Yeah, that that's awesome. And I got the I got the chance to meet Joe Staley at the Senior Bowl. You know, a lot of the times cuz I'm just getting started in like getting credentialed to some things mm-hmm. and like, you know, meeting people or just seeing people who I admire. And I don't think I was more starstruck uh, than, you know, seeing Joe Staley, right? Because I, I grew up watching. I'm love the 49ers, mm-hmm. right? So that that one hit different and I did get a chance to meet him and it was just it was just so awesome. Like the, nothing can really top that. So um, I'd like to think I, I know, you know, the feeling when, when you get to work with like Jerry Rice and you yeah. get to meet some of these guys for sure. Um, well, look, the 49ers, you know, we know for the NFL, free agency is in full swing. What are you thinking about some of these moves? You, you like them so far as a fan? Oh yeah. Hargrave. <laughs> I mean, I was like, oh my goodness. Like, We thought the defense was good before. And I just thought it was so apropos, like from the Eagles, like, okay, you know, we see what you did there. Mm -hmm. We're going to like, we're going to do the same thing. I mean, I pity the other, the teams that are going to have to deal with interior defender now who matches the edge rushers. And I, I mean, I just, I love, love, love that move. Um, 
you know, it was, we, we knew that we were going to see some of the losses that we did. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the Jimmy G, I, I have, there's like this bittersweet thing for me. Like he came so close, you know, Super Bowl in a Super Bowl, NFC championship, um, just the injury situation was just so unfortunate. Um, and it was time, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I, I will always respect the hell out of him for what he did for the 49ers and how good he was in the locker room and how he came back after that shoulder surgery and did what he did to bridge the 49ers season last year. Um, it was, uh, you know, I wonder what it will be like with the Raiders and to think, yeah. I wonder how he feels about them getting rid of Darren Waller right after he got there. Um, but uh, I, I felt like that was going to happen. So it didn't really surprise me. Um, I think, you know, and then the Sam Darnold move we talked about, yeah. you know, it, I think that made sense in terms of uh, what they needed to do to provide not only a, you know, a little bit of competition maybe in the, in the quarterback room, but also insurance and a veteran presence and somebody who's going to fit. I, one thing I really admire about what I think uh, between Shanahan and Lynch have done is they're very sensitive to what that dynamic is in the locker room, you know, and because that is something I travel to a lot of different teams during training camp. And I'm just here to tell you that that is not everywhere. <laughs> you know, it is not everywhere. And it, teams crave that they they crave seeing guys all rally around each other the right. way that it's so obvious the 49ers do and that locker room's so good um you can't just bring anyone in they have yeah. to fit there and i think they're very sensitive to that and i don't think a lot of organizations are and i think that's part of the reason they've been able to be so successful despite some of the challenges that they've had yeah, I, I agree. They're very protective of the culture they've built, and I I appreciate that a lot. It it, it makes sense. Well, look, uh, we we've, we've had you here for like an hour. I, <laughs> I, I thank you so much for this um, time that you've you've lent to us. One last question, because you know it was just recently uh, Woman in Sports Day, and you know <laughs> you you've paved a way for yourself in this industry. What would you say to a woman trying to break into sports media? Uh, well, first of all, there's certainly a lot more women than even in the last, you know, decade. I've been with ESPN. This is my, this would be my fifth is 15 years or yeah, 15 or 16. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, 16th year. Um, which is crazy to say out loud. But, uh, when I first got there, there were far fewer women than there are now far. Mm -hmm. And I think that just goes to show you how, um, how much the space has grown and the opportunities have been there for women. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it's, it's just only going to continue um, both because women build up women or may open the door, but also there were a number, it's certainly my case because there were fewer women present. Um, there were a number of men who opened that door as well. And I think you're seeing that um, you see it in the league. I mean, the NFL has really made an effort to kind of bring more women into the fold in all aspects, uh, whether it's front office, um, coaching staffs, athletic training staffs, what have you. So um, I would just, it, it's very cliche and boring, but it's like, you know, be, be yourself, yourself. I mean, I don't think there's anything to do differently as a woman, I think it's about doing whatever it is that you are uh, have chosen as your path, your professional path to do that and do it well. You know, if you're if you're the best at your job, they can't deny you because of your gender. <laughs> you know, right. It's like just be the best at your job, be the best at what you do and just believe that you are and and believe that you can be and show them you know i think um the the one thing is it's funny i i when when some of us who are of uh, a little more mature in the, like, in terms of our years um think about it you know you see people coming out who immediately want to be at the top like i want to bypass steps a b c and d and skyrocket to you know the top i want the full tv show in my name i want this i want that you know and for some people that happens and I, 
good for them, you know, but that's not the way it usually happens. Usually it happens because you're, it, you know, you're, you're doing things um, on a progression ladder that's going to yeah. open other doors and opportunities for you. And I think people, we do it like with coaches would be like, where'd this guy come from this way? But if you look, they've been doing things along the way to right. help get themselves there. They've been impressing people along the way who then said, well, you know what? You stand out. Why don't you go do this? You stand out. Why do you go do this? So I think just, you know, if you have in your mind set what it is that you want to be able to do and you put your energy towards it uh, and and you excel at it and you have to you have to work hard. There's not really a substitute for the hard work. And some of it, it looks really fun. And we're always having a good time on the show and this and that. But there's a lot of hard work that goes into behind the scenes. There's a lot of working on weekends or late nights or doing things when when other people might not be. And, uh, you know, that's part of it. Yeah. And everyone thinks like, oh, it's sports. It'd be so fun to do <laughs> oh, this, so but, fun. which it is, but it, it is. But yeah, to your point, there there is so much work in the background that, you know, honestly, a, a lot of people, when once they get introduced to that work, would be like, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah. I don't, maybe this isn't for me kind of thing. So yeah, I, I totally get that. And I think and a lot of no's, you know, you do get, you know, you, you get rejection. Oh, how about this idea that I have? Mm, no, we're not interested. I mean, I still deal with that. Even pitching things internally in my company, like, oh, I'd really like to do that. Yeah, no, we don't think so. Okay. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to stop asking or stop right. trying or, you know, keep pursuing things. So I think, uh, you know, just that, that, that's, uh, I've run out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this is, this is a great place to, to end it. And, and Stefania, once again, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so much fun. And I do also want to give a quick shout out to my followers on Twitter because, you know, back in October when I did tweet at you, uh, so many of you guys retweeted and, and commented. And so I, I give you guys a lot of credit for, you know, making this happen here. And so of course, Stefania as well. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Time. I'm sorry. It took me so long. Of course, during the season, I become a bit of a ghost, you know, because no, I mean, you're busy. Yeah, like it, it makes total sense. So <laughs> I, I totally get it. So and, I appreciate your persistence and uh, I, look, nothing makes me happier than talking about the 49ers. Ask my coworkers who suffer through it all the time. <laughs> they, they will tell you. So uh, it, it, it is really fun. And I love, you know, I love seeing what you've done and you've dedicated yourself to, uh, you know, a 49ers focused podcast. And I appreciate that. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep checking out the, the fantasy focus podcast. I love that one and uh, have a good rest of your Thursday and all mm -hmm. you guys watching as well. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.